Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining me. My name is Tim Payne. I'm a principal consultant with the Bluefin Group, and today I'm here to present to you a bit about 340B. The title of my webinar today is 340B at 30 and the impending cliff on the road to 40. As you can imagine, this has been a very interesting and hot topic as of late, and I hope to give you a little bit of food for thought today to discuss for just further discussion. A little bit about me, a uh, principal consultant with the Bluefin Group, as I noted, since uh, 2021. Prior to that, I was the VP for Pharma Strategy and Relations at Fairview Pharmacy Services in Minneapolis, part of the University of Minnesota M Health Fairview Health System. Uh, brief time with Pfizer on their biosimilars team and many years with Amgen in both in commercial sales and in clinical research. And I would offer you this disclaimer on my talk today. It's contained in here is a really informed by my experiences and opinions and is, doesn't represent the opinion of Bluefin Group, its associates or its clients. And all positions, opinions and interpretations or inferences contained in this presentation are those of me and are offered for your thought and consideration as you develop your own on this topic, which I encourage you to do. So some of the concepts and objectives for today's presentation, I will provide a bit of discussion around observations of the confluence of events that have led up to the state of 340B as we know it here in 2022, and some thoughts on the, what the road looks like going towards 2032. So what's gonna look like going to, as 340B gets to 40? What this is not, is I'm not here to provide an in, insights on the ins and outs of how 340B works. And so it's not a 340B 101 talk, but uh, I will talk a, just a touch about contract pharmacies in a little bit more detail. But I also will not note who's right and who's wrong in this sort of situation. That's really up for you all to discuss and figure out on your own, uh, hopefully from using some of the discussions of this talk, this presentation today. So I'll talk a bit about how we got here, number of the parallel events that have occurred along the way that are driving a lot of the activity in this space. As I aforementioned, I talked about contract pharmacies, a bit into that subject, is that touchy subject as of late. Uh, and we'll look at those beyond the manufacturer side too. What's going on in, with payers, HRSA, and, and patients for sure. And then the call to action will be what's going to look like going to 2032 and what do I see happening there? So how do we find ourselves here? 340B has been around as noted for 30 years and I have the obligatory statement around there about its creation being to stretch scarce federal resources uh, at hospitals caring for patients who were not had little or no ability to pay. So it was created in, by Congress in 1992 and has been a stipulation for participation in the Medicaid program ever since. In 1996, Congress recognized and really under HRSA's aegis recognized that this program where you qualify based upon your inpatient spend, but you are allowed to use its benefits only on the outpatient side, a number of those that qualified didn't have outpatient pharmacies or didn't have ones that were convenient for their patients. So they came up with this idea of a contract pharmacy, allowed for a single contract pharmacy for those entities without an outpatient pharmacy. And this typically at that point retail outlet was afforded the opportunity to act as the agent for the health system. That worked rather well. And so far into 2001, five years down the road, they HRSA started a demonstration project to look at the idea of more than, more than one contract pharmacy and evaluate networks of them for given covered entities. That program went very, very well apparently because around the time of the Affordable Care Act coming to, to, into play and more entities being able to qualify at a slightly reduced threshold as well, the HRSA legislation was changed to, and modified or amended properly to allow for multiple contract pharmacies, really an unlimited, unlimited number uh, within a covered entity going forward. Fasting, fast forward as that program grew, and I'll talk more about that in a few more slides, you get to see the first step in the direction of limiting these sorts of activities and these sorts of actions. And when Eli Lilly established limitations on contract pharmacy access to three to Cialis, at the time in that summer of 2020 was seen as quite a radical move, but now it appears after so many years uh, and 16 other companies taking similar action is 
more of just a toe in the water. So really a, a small step in what's become a much bigger move along the way. In the second half of 2020, you started to see many more companies take action there, as noted by Merck, Sanofi, Novartis, AZ, and Novo Nordisk. Uh, following that time period, uh, HHS has issued an advisory, peer, advisory opinion on this, which basically said, no, you can't. Um, Lilly, Sanofi, and AstraZeneca all filed lawsuits, and those have been going on ever since. In fact, as I speak here in May of 2022, only briefs were only just recently filed for many of them, which will for sure take these cases out into late summer and early fall of this year. But those cases are now really focused around the administrative dispute resolution um, that is a, a, a process that is afforded to HRSA for resolution of disputes between the organizations involved. These have gone on, this has gone back and forth, um, as you can see from the timeline, which I will, will leave for you to read as uh, you don't need me to read it for you, but really has left us at the point in time with 16 different manufacturers restricting covered entities use of contract pharmacies in various ways, shapes, and forms. So what does the future look like for manufacturers, covered entities, HRSA, and for patients? Part of the confluence of how we got here has been really one of the more interesting factors I found in researching this topic was at the top right in this in-person or inpatient versus outpatient revenue growth function that you can see here from 2011 to 2018 was the most recent data I was able to access. The interesting factor here is that as you can see it getting closer and closer together, and we can likely presume that here in 2022, they, those two lines have all but met, is going back to 1992 when this whole program started. When you look at that point, there were $3 in inpatient spend for every $1 in outpatient spend. So think about that when the program was created, you qualified on inpatient, but the benefit accrued to the outpatient. Think of what was going on on the outpatient side as far as widely used uh, outpatient drugs, their cost, uh, and you start to see that there really probably wasn't a lot going on in that space at that point in time. But as you can see from that graph and the one to the left, the program has been growing by leaps and bounds ever since. And of course, as I put this data together um, and finished up all my slides, the 2021 data came out noting that surprise, surprise, it had grown by another 15, 16% into the $90 billion range. So you can see some of the key drivers there at the bottom, certainly specialty growth as, as you likely well know has been outpacing primary care growth by a substantial margin. And certainly those therapies that are administered in, by the patient themselves or a caregiver as opposed to in the clinic have also grown by leaps and bounds as well. One of the further areas that has driven some of the uh, growth in the 340B program has really been a high concentration of specialty meds in areas that are frankly high development interest areas for manufacturers. I know in my time at Fairview, when I was tracking 500 lines on a spreadsheet of all the different new drugs and indications that were heading our way, well, guess what? About a half of them, no, pardon me, a third of them were targeted oncology agents. And so you can see that those oral oncology agents were being coming to market after many, many decades, frankly, of research into tyrosine kinase inhibitors, for example. Uh, many of these pro products are now come to market and were successful. They're self-administered oral agents, perfect setup for specialty pharmacy med growth. So an area that has been of great development interest, not for any thought of around 340B, has been a big driver for a lot of this. And you can see other areas listed there in addition to their uh, targeted oncology. Um, certainly other areas that you'll recognize has been high growth areas for specialty meds and consequently specialty pharmacy, and consequently 340B. Now HRSA's regulations have also impacted this. As I touched on at the outset for, during the um, timeline, you can see the kind of sequence of events there that occurred on the left with contract pharmacies from first being permitted to have one to having several via a demonstration product to leading to unlimited numbers later on. 
coinciding with the execution of the Affordable Care Act in 2010, you saw several different factors listed there at the bottom right, Medicaid enrollment, hospital eligibility changing, and 340B contract entities, uh, covered entities and contract pharmacies growing, all leading to the graph at the upper right is a greatly increased number of contract pharmacy arrangements that took place from 2010 to 2020. So you can see a, a incredible amount of growth in those spaces, um, really one thing adding to another. Now, what are these contract pharmacies and how exactly do they work? Uh, a colleague of mine put together this very nice chart and it's allowed me to use, so I appreciate that. Um, and this little Visio is able to show when things start from the covered entity and how the product, the financial relationship and the contract relationship flow. So you can see basically the contracting relationship is with the adequately or appropriately named contract pharmacy. And then from there to the patient. So the patient gets their product, it's covered by their insurance company, the PBM payer in this case. The drug is then resupplied to the contract pharmacy via a uh, process noted there in number three, all through the benefit of, or through the uh, process of understanding uh, what exactly qualifies and what it doesn't via the split billing vendor uh, software program. You can see there that the split billing vendor, um, these are the centuries, centuries and macro helixes and others of the world, they do have a financial flow. Some of those are flat fee based and others are based upon a percentage, but albeit uh, a financial flow there as well. What you can see here is two things I would like to point out. One is here you have seven different entities or seven different participate in this whole program. Six of them are working very closely together all around this contract pharmacy relationship. And one of them, the patient is really left out of it, frankly, in a good way, because they're not seen as I'll call it the sausage making going on behind the scenes and all this. And really all they're doing is their doctor wrote them a script, they got their script, it was covered by their insurance. Everything's fine for them. The other thing I would offer in this alignment is that it's how it's changed over time. While these were at the previous seven different entities, now you see many of the, you see an alignment of the PBM payer box there with the contract pharmacies being under the same ownership umbrella. And in some cases that's been narrowed down even further with the split billing vendor, or at least one case being part of that organization as well. So you can see the concentration and vertical integration that's been happening in this space in just the short time that these uh, arrangements have been uh, afforded and available. So what do they look like on the ground? So DISH hospitals can be local retail pharmacies, but they're also, as you might well have guessed, PBM aligned SPs. Now this is the actual data from the HRSA database on a large health system in the Midwest. No, it's not the one I used to work for. That would be a little too obvious. But as you can see here, they have 330 contract pharmacy arrangements with a variety of organizations. Um, really, the more, couple interesting points I would like to highlight here is that 90% of the contract pharmacy relationships for this organization are represented by six entities. You can see there Walgreens, CVS, Optum, a local retail chain, the covered entities own contract pharmacy, so their own in-house pharmacies, as well as a credo and ESI. So when I look at this, I have to step back and think, so why the preponderance of Walgreens uh, outlets? And if you dive into the reference there and go look in any given health system and pick a rather large one that you know, is which I would encourage you to do, and look at their arrangements, and you'll see in particular here for Walgreens, there is a substantial number, like the vast majority of these are local brick and mortar retail outlets. They are convenient set, uh, retail pharmacies for those patients who see providers in these, these health systems clinics. So as the program got started, as they set things up back in 1996 with the first contract pharmacies, you can see that's exactly where they were headed. Now, some of those Walgreens outlets are definitely specialty pharmacies as well. And you'll see that trickling down into CVS. There are a number of retail outlets, but there's a little bit greater concentration of specialty, of specialty pharmacies there as well. Optum, on the other hand, is certainly skews more towards the number of specialty pharmacies, as does Acredo and ESI. 
But what really you see here is if you dig into it a bit further, that while specialty drives the dollar volume in those locations, the primary care drives the number of pharmacies. Really the outlets that you see when you see this 330 number, where are they, why do they need that many for specialty pharmacy? Well, they don't have 330 specialty pharmacies. They have a number of them, but they're also mixed in with quite a few retail outlets. So the devil's in the details. Now with the uh, various stakeholders in the programs, you're seeing at the same time that manufacturers are wondering about this program, what's going on with regard to health system specialty pharmacies. There's been a great interest in them at the same time because they are outperforming their competition. As you can see here from some net promoter scores that were published in a press release a few years back, the health system average of 80 is virtually double that of the PBM SP and higher than that of the retail and independent SP average as well. This is a number that is fairly consistent from my experience over time in that you see health system specialty pharmacies vastly outperforming their brethren in others from other uh, organizations. And part of that reason is on the left, they have pharmacists and technicians that are embedded in the clinic. So they have a particular pharmacist and they have technicians who are running the BI, BV, PA work on that side of things, getting the ball rolling, triaging the, the scripts out if they can't be filled by their pharmacy and getting it where it needs to go very quickly. There's greater continuity of care thanks to being able to go right from the clinic to the MTM programs that are uh, hosted by many of these systems. And there's certainly the connection with key opinion leaders should there be needs of, from those folks as well. These groups are also a key source of context for payers. When they're looking at what is a new drug coming to market, where is it going to be used, how much of it can be used, what's it going to look like, boots on the ground, when a doctor's actually using it, who better to go to than some than an expert in one of these health systems? So these connections from their specialty pharmacies are affording the opportunity for payers to receive a good deal of context about what the real world is going to look like with this new product. And as you can see on the right, the superior customer, ser customer service scores have been a, a, a constant over this group's period of time since they've been uh, observed in this area. Now, while contract pharmacies um, have been an area of contention for stakeholders in a number for some time, given the growth rate, but their degree and involvement really is predicated on a number of factors. And while all the criteria on the left are listed there and how those things work, it's really predicated on a number of factors. First, the payer and PBM re is restricting access to their SP. So there's really no benefit in them for that, for doing this if it's not lined up in that vertical sort of integration. The payer SP also have, has to have access to the specialty med. They're not gonna be able to receive a script for a drug where they don't have access. Then, in addition, the covered entity has to have access to the specialty bed so they can fulfill the replenishment model that typically takes place with these programs, or they have to have permission from the manufacturer to access us for access to solely set up a contract pharmacy arrangement so that there's no actual prospective purchases that are going to the location of the health system. They're all going to the contract pharmacy. And there's at least several of those programs out there that I'm personally aware of and worked in the past. So all these things have to line up and have to happen for this all to fly. The payers themselves have found them well positioned for, the, for benefit from these programs. And as you can see from the, from the right-hand graph there, the trend in vertically integrated contract pharmacy arrangements has skyrocketed since 2010. And you can really see it taking off around 2016 and 2017 when it really jumped. Because they look, they have the access to the patient, they have access to the product, and they've been, they're in a very, very good position to capture the bulk of the contract pharmacy opportunity. And their position in the market has only strengthened. Um, frankly, if you were in their position, what would you have done? Um, I can see this as, frankly, those folks are taking advantage of a business opportunity that was placed right in front of them. Other stakeholders that have had certainly a great deal of influence, but in a way you might not have expected on this, is HRSA and the FDA. Now, this might seem a little bit odd, but one of the legal challenges that led us to this situation we're in right now had nothing to do with 340B price drugs, but really about or their, what their prices could be and who could access them so much as it was tied to the orphan indication rostered within the orphan drug database. As you may well know, covered entities that are of dish hospitals 
uh, were not excluded with the with the Affordable Care Act from accessing orphan drugs, but those new grantees are. It was one of the limitations of the introduced with the program back at that time. Well, some of these organizations, these grantees noted that while the drug may have improved have been approved under an orphan indication, its expanded indications were certainly not orphan and there were drugs were being used in those non-orphan indications. So that shouldn't qualify. The, when the HRSA started to act in their favor, manufacturers took them to court. And in 2014, the US District Court ruled that HRSA didn't have the re required rulemaking authority to issue such a rule. Not that they were right or they were wrong, but they didn't have the required rulemaking authority. Now, HRSA tried to cover this by coming up with an interpretive ruling stating with essentially the same view, but that was vacated right away. And subsequently, manufacturers have been using their own discretion on whether to price, provide 340B pricing for the newly approved orphan drugs for those grantees. So not in a case where it's been mandated or legislated, but really at their own discretion. And it's really this legal outcome is noted at the bottom there that has set the stage for the current 340B challenges due to Hearst's lack of rulemaking authority. So as I've gone through a variety of inputs leading to one very tangled output to the right there, you can see many of the inputs to the right. And I selected a few here to kind of highlight. But when you look at the growth of specialty meds, as I noted before, we've certainly seen a dramatic change from 1992 to 2022, where we're at right now. You're also seeing a great deal of change in what's gone on from that time to this time when it came to commercial rebates. In 1992, I would gather they were probably fairly infrequent and now they're very, very common. There's also been great changes to the 340B or legislation that has, that has impacted the 340B legislation as well. Certainly the Affordable Care Act being right up there with increased number of covered entities, contract pharmacy arrangements, and the eligibility criteria change. There's also been, as I noted earlier, a great deal of vertical integration between the PBMs and SPs, uh, leading to certain concentrations and therefore payer lockouts as they organize themselves in such a way to maximize their business opportunity. And there's also been the rise of the IDN SP and ASP, I will add in there as well. So certainly the continuity of care that has been demonstrated by health system specialty pharmacies is driving a great deal of interest as they've done very, very well in growing in that space and demonstrating their capabilities. There's also been a good deal of driving a direction of health systems as many of you know, uh, there's been a great deal, number of mergers between health systems and private practice clinics. Uh, I would posit that a not an insignificant amount of that occurred because of the ASP legislation in 2005, 2006, that changed radically the reimbursement for in, in physician infused drugs or administered drugs to the point where uh, it wasn't just hospitals looking to buy up practices, practices were looking to buy up or uh, buy into or be bought by uh, health systems, uh, who were certainly the most attractive ones were those that were covered entities. So as I mentioned, as I went through this, you can see us what got us here, this tangled road to 2032. So as I stated at this outset, there's a cliff. So where's the cliff, right? So when you're, what will it take to avoid the cliff and what's going to happen along the way? The program, is it going to stick around? Is it going to be here in 2032? Yes, that's the short answer. Um, ending the program would leave a gigantic hole in health system finances. Just think back to where we were in 1992. Those health systems, because of previously enacted legislation, were required to treat all comers and were losing money and went to the federal government looking for better reimbursement. Instead, they created a drug discount program for use on the outpatient side. That filled the gap but would there be an appetite to fill it if 340B went away? I would say no, frankly, because they already have somebody doing it. They being federal government have somebody, manufacturers doing it for them. So why would they ever say, well, we'll take it over instead and take on an extra $100 billion worth of expense. So what will also happen is I think HRSA will eventually get their ADR um, legislation in order. They will eventually have themselves with their hand tied behind their back will be untied or they will have a legally 
uh, blessed way of untying their hand because I do not think there's a court that will say, you know, the a legislative body, a group like a regulatory body like HRSA may not regulate and may not enforce their regulations. I really don't see that happen. It will take some time and there will be lots of back and forth in the courts. As I said earlier, we're already to August of this year before we ever really see much of anything. And it will certainly go into 2023 in my mind before this is complete. But there will be pushback at that time once they do get that in order and it will be pushback, pushing back on pharma's unilateral changes um, quite quickly. At that point in time, lobbying will increase. There's no doubt about that both pharma and the hospital side of this um, equations will uh, engage in aggressive lobbying campaigns for their sides of things. But where I see the real cliff is the one group that I only mentioned briefly in all this, and that's when patients are impacted. And when patients are impacted is when the 340B program is negatively impacted to the point where many of these smaller uh, hospitals and smaller clinics are forced to close. So an outreach clinic in Arnold, Nebraska, or Greeley, uh, Greeley Kansas, or Ronan, Montana, some places, small places like that, when those places start to close and the local paper carries because the manufacturers pushed so hard that the 340B program, their source of funds for this small little clinic has now dried up, that will be bad and it will fall disproportionately right in pharma's lap. So it may seem unfair, it may seem um, in some respects a, a disproportionate uh, share of the grief in all of this, but I would have to posit along with this that the negative impact or the negative impression of the manufacturer side is something that already sits close to the tip of the tongue of media, legislative uh, bodies, as well as uh, the lay public. So it is an inordinate amount of risk, I think, that is going forward and will lay, unfortunately, right at the feet of manufacturers. So what can be done about this? Really, I think the first step, a kind of obvious step, is proactive portfolio management with an eye on the impact of 340B. You really need as a manufacturer to be looking at this position from uh, each stakeholder's position and the needs and drivers you develop for your market access strategy. I would also encourage you to get involved with education around 340B. Take an eye, a closer look to an, at an idea and close to you, like I illustrated previously, the one with 330 contract pharmacies. Look at how they're connected. You'll see this, frankly, a spider web of connections, but you'll also see some repetition that is very interesting in there because not necessarily a single clinic is tied to a single pharmacy because even with that one payer, they may fail three different oncology drugs from three different specialty pharmacy locations. So that one clinic for those three drugs has to have three connections. So three contract pharmacies. So it's, it gets very complex very fast. I would also encourage you to get education along the lines like from a Texas to 340B University is an excellent on-demand educational resource in this space. And I would say this is a great need in the manufacturer space because I've personally sat on a number of calls with some very intelligent individuals from, from very large manufacturers who were rather deficient in their knowledge of the basics of the program, yet they are the ones writing the rules around how this is going to go forward from their side of things. So I think there is a great opportunity for education in this space by both sides. And I would also say collaboration needs to, um, needs to be engaged with to remove the ambiguity and lack of clarity. So get out of the courtroom, get into the boardroom, start working with covered entities, covered entities, be receptive and start working with manufacturers because understanding um, what the what each side is looking for, and I'll step back for a second and say on the education side, covered entities could certainly learn a lot about what all the ins and outs are from the manufacturer side for this, this very complex program. There's a great deal to be learned there as well. But I think once both sides can get involved and engage on what each other's drivers are and how they can come to a positive resolution on this, you might find a receptive gr uh, group in uh, Washington, D.C. I'd love to hear what you have to say. So I will conclude that uh, at this time and say thank you very much for your time and attention. Again, I'm Tim Payne, Principal Consultant with Lufin Group, and I'd like to thank you for joining me today for this program. Bye-bye.